Hi, folks. I'm Glenn. And I'm Maureen. And today, on our adventure, we're going to be walking through the property and looking at the state of a lot of our trees and our mixed forest. And a lot of the uh, the trees are old, and some of them are, are young growth. But we have mixed forests from the hardwood maples. Uh, we have uh, yellow birches. We also have some mixed coniferous trees like the hemlocks, the spruce, the cedars. And as we walk, we try to pay attention to the trees that are possibly in stress. Some of them, some of the limbs and whatnot are ready to come down. Some of the trees are leaning quite a bit over the, over the cabin trail. And today we're going to look at one tree in particular that's, uh, it's a bit of a threat to the cabin trail and uh, to our safety. So we're going to be looking at that as well. The drainage of the land, keeping our trail open and keeping an eye on how things are draining because we've had such a crazy winter, really cold weather and, and warm weather. And that warm weather brings some drainage concerns that we have to keep an eye on. And as well, we're going to be doing part two of viewer questions and we'll provide some answers and whatnot right here on Cabin Life. Take a look at this tree here folks. Huge. Huge hemlock. It appears that from here anyway, it appears that the tree might be in distress at the roots there. And Maureen said when she was walking on her walk with Jake that it was cracking in the wind. She could hear it cracking. So let's uh, just have a listen here. I'm just going to go investigate the, the bottom of it. I haven't noticed it like this before because of the snow and that. Let's just see what condition it's in over there. From the front here, it actually doesn't look like it's in too bad a shape. It looks like it's, it doesn't look like it's, um, the, the root ball is ripped up or, or damaged. Um, there's a bunch of other tree fall on top, which uh, doesn't look that great, but I don't think it's affecting the tree. I'm going to go around the back and see. Hey, Jake. Yeah, you can hear it cracking. It's There's a few critters living under here in the in the uh, in the little holes and nooks and crannies of the trees. I'm pretty sure there's looks like there's a couple critters could live here. Well, Jake always checks that spot out every walk. This is the crack in the tree that we've been hearing. It's quite deep, you can see the raw wood inside of there. And it goes up about, that's about 15 feet. Four or five meters. Okay, I'm just gonna walk away from the tree and We'll listen for some cracking.
That tree is cracking pretty good. And uh, there it goes. It's hard to say which way that tree is going to go if a, a big windstorm comes along. The way it's leaning is it's, it's leaning away from the trail into the bush about uh, 10 feet up, but then it, it starts, it grows just as straight and true as can be. Beautiful. You got a few good lengths of logs of uh, timber in that tree. But, uh, It's hard to say which way it would actually go. I think it would fall into the into the bush, but it's possible that it would want to twist around and come back this way. You just never know. That's probably a ten thousand pound tree. Easy. There's a raven. Well, here it is. It's uh, right on cue. We have our January thaw. And uh, usually every January, after the big freeze up, cold snap of uh, late December, usually we, uh, we have what we call a January thaw. Temperatures get mild, we get a little bit of rain, and then freezing rain. And that's usually followed by either a ton of snow or a real bad cold snap once again. And uh, from what I understand, the uh, weather forecast says we're in for a cold snap. What you're seeing is snow fog. It's just the, uh, the moisture coming out of the snowfall, out of the, uh, all this melting snow. Moisture's coming out of it. Just want to show you something here. We uh, we put a, a culvert in across our our uh, laneway trail here last uh, fall, and um, there was a lot of water that was building up uh, on one side of the laneway. And when the uh, when the mild weather came and uh, under the torrential rains that we had last year, a really wet year uh, last year, as far as we know. Uh, it was uh, much wetter than normal years around this property. So um, this is uh, the area, a little bit of a low, low-lying area where the water wanted to naturally drain in the springtime. It would saturate this whole trail here. And it would come across right across the trail, about 70 feet. So now, what we did was, last year we had, uh, we dug that up, right where Jake is right now. We had dug that all the way across from Jake, right through to where the camera is now. And we put a culvert in, and there's the culvert seven or eight inch. But you can see on this side, it's absolutely jam packed full of solid ice. Not sure how far back that goes like that, but with all the cold snaps that we've had, minus 20 and minus 30 temperatures, um, everything had froze up solid everywhere, and it, as it normally does. With this, we've had some mild spells. And with the mild temperatures, the upper end of where the water is gathering, when we had rain and whatnot, it came down and obviously it thawed the, the top part of the ice. And where the culvert comes through here, I'll just show you, right here. 
not sure how far that goes in. We'll have a look at that. Anyway, it's all solid ice by the looks of it. It's all solid beneath me. So, I'm wondering if that is going to naturally thaw and then flood this area here. I'd like to be able to uh, have peace of mind that it's not going to want to saturate all the ground that is from that wetland, that wet area, low, low lying area, all the way to, to where I'm walking now, straight back from it, in this little bit of a clearing area. And uh, it gets so saturated um, just before uh, the trail uh, narrows down quite a bit and goes up to the cabin. And hopefully it's going to uh, drain good this year, but uh, with the culvert being plugged up and blocked right now, full of ice. I'm wondering if there's something I can do to help alleviate this problem in the spring with the melt so that we have a good melt off and that the water goes through the culvert where it's been designed to go th through. Let's hope that it does. So I'm wondering if I could, if I brought down a burning can, actually I've got a, I've got a couple of burning cans right there. Uh, I think Maureen might be using those for storage stuff, so I better I better ask. I better ask first. <laughs> if I was to make a nice a big fire in the can and uh, just let that burn for a few days and make a make a pothole that melts all the water and so forth, I'm wondering if the water w would melt off enough and then um, and then go through the culvert, find its way down and start melting some of the ice as it runs down. They kind of pick up some mild days where I know that the weather's going to have a few mild days in a row, perhaps, and uh, see about melting it. I'm not sure if that'll help or not, or, if, you know, if it's a futile thing to do. Better go see what Jake's doing. Luckily, the culvert was only frozen a short way in, so a few pots of boiling water did the trick. We're trying to get this water flow going. It's been such a crazy winter. We had minus 40 degree weather, minus 30, and then plus 7. And today, today it's around plus 3, plus 4. And we have all this water backed up. And the area that went to the culvert froze. And it wasn't letting all the water through. So last night we worked on freeing up the ice in front of the culvert. So that it would flow. My, is it ever flowing good? Hi, Jake. Are you our checker guy? Huh? Our big concern isn't so much for now. It's that if all this freezes and doesn't get away, then when our spring rains start, it's going to be way worse. So Gwen and I are working on getting that water moved out. <laughs> look at, look at Jake. Down it goes, Jake. You can't get it now. It's gone. <laughs> So Glenn went in to make a coffee. It should be just about ready. I'm ready for a coffee. And then we'll come back out and check and see what else we can do. So some people have been asking us uh, about some of the things in our videos and want to know a few things. And thought uh, we'll take this time to to uh, answer those questions, maybe clarify a few things. And another question that we've had come up a few times is, are we afraid of the bears and the cougars and wolves that are in the area? And in, in uh, Cabin Life uh, episode six, we have uh, some footage of our trail cams and bears coming right up to the trail cam. So if you want to see that, check out episode six. Uh, we have um, also recordings of the wolves that uh, frequent the area. 
No, we're not afraid in any way of, uh, of the, the bear or cougar or wolves. We haven't seen any cougar, but we've seen sign of cougar. As our neighbors confirmed uh, during Christmas when we saw them was uh, that they, they had uh, confirmed that uh, they had seen a cougar and uh, talked to their neighbor about it. And uh, the neighbor also had seen, uh, uh, I'm not sure if he saw the cougar or saw sign of the cougar as well, as we have as well. So, uh, but no, we're not afraid. Uh, we're respectful and uh, we certainly don't give them any reason to... Uh, feel provoked if we ever do see anything like that we keep our distance and we don't leave food out uh, Maureen's very careful with our uh, food waste management well we have a garbage and a recycling containment system that bears cannot get into or any other animal that could create a mess that could bring a bear steel steel sealed can steel sealed they can't be opened except by us um, and our barbecue areas, picnic areas, anywhere we have food, we are absolutely very vigilant at never leaving food out or any food scraps or the smells of grease on the barbecues and so forth. That's always cleaned up. And actually, we've been camping and canoeing and living in the wilderness areas for 40 years. And we have never had a bear incident or any other type of incident. Uh, one little critter got into something, right? In the backpack when we were down on Georgian Bay one year. Um, what, what park was that? Massasauga, Massasauga Provincial Park, beautiful park. And we rode on an island. And uh, even though uh, uh, we felt we were pretty safe from bears visiting, we still put our backpack up in the tree and hung it from the tree uh, on a rope and uh, way out on a limb. And uh, it's just, common practice for us to do that and uh, because a bear could still swim across the channel to the island you never know right so I mean they've got an incredible sense of smell on them but I think what got I think a, a, I think a mouse or a squirrel actually climbed down the rope and, and got into the flap of the backpack and and nibbled away at a loaf of bread so but that that was about it so we learned from an early age to be very careful with our food management. What I've learned is most animals, including bear, uh, have very good memories when it comes to where they get their food from. Where do they get that reward? From miles and miles away, uh, downwind, it can, it can uh, smell food and it'll go to that place. And if it gets rewarded with a morsel of food, it will kind of like put that food reward on its list, check mark, and then visit back probably at the same time the following day or the next within the next few days so that food source now becomes on its route so if you've seen a bear in your garbage or on your doorstep eating the dog food or or eating the bird seed um, be prepared because that bear very likely could come back for a visit and that's when you have to have all eyes and ears open because uh you could be in for a surprise visit. In that case, you don't need to be afraid, but now you have to manage your behavior because you've just trained the bear to come for lunch. So knowing that you've invited him to the dinner table, now you have to be extremely prepared to deal with that situation. Yeah, it's just a situation you just don't want to be in. And see, with being new to the area, like there's a lot of vacant land around surrounding our property. So, and this was vacant too. There's a lot of, um, also a lot of crown land. Yeah. A lot of crown a lot land. Of, yeah. So, there has not been people here before. So, it was really important that when we moved here, and we moved into the bear's backyard, that we didn't teach them that they now had a, like Glenn said, that they didn't have a lunch depot stop off. That's place. right. Take note of what she said there. So, when we moved into the bear's backyard. The bear don't move into our backyard just because we have purchased the land, <laughs> right? Yeah. We're the stewards of the land, but it's the bear's land. We moved into their backyard. And any of the bears that you see on our cameras, they kept going. And all the other bears, anything that we've seen, they kept going because there was nothing here for them. So they were going along their regular trails. And because we didn't interrupt them with any reason to stay, they just kept going. So yeah. 
and any other critters that could possibly come around and get into your garbage. Like we're talking about squirrels and raccoons because they get into your garbage and then they make a mess and that creates problems too. Nature should be appreciated, shared, and respected. respected. It should be preserved, cared for, and protected for future generations. And if everyone did that, wildlife and us would get along just fine. Like we do. So are we afraid of the bears? No, there's no need to fear the bears or the wildlife. Uh, we respect it, keep our distance, don't give them food, no reason to be provoked, no reason to threaten them, no reason to make them feel threatened, and um, uh, we appreciate them from a distance. So it's a matter of risk management. Like we have our dog, and we do walk with the dog on the leash as we're walking up and down the lane. But we do let the dog have his exercise while we're walking, and we do let him off the leash, as you've seen. The other thing that we've uh, had mentioned is that people enjoy our channel, and uh, this is this is our life, and this is our cabin, and yes, we have a house now. But we still live the same as we lived in the cabin in the sense of living in the wilderness and what we do in the wilderness. Right. And as we share our experiences and episodes with you about cabin life, um, that's exactly what we're sharing. The things that have to do with cabin life. We're going to have all kinds of adventures coming up and, and we're happy to share that stuff with you. But we're not going to invent things that we could do just to create uh, content for YouTube, um, you know, that is dramatic or, or whatever. We're going to share that stuff with you as it happens, and uh, we're going to keep it real. And uh, as the one fellow had mentioned, he was listening to the, to the uh, bushcraft, uh, bushcraft guy that was supposed to be out in the middle of the wilderness, and the, the uh, listener viewer put his headphones on and he, he could swear he heard a garage door open, uh, opener, the electric garage door <laughs> opener and, and uh, you know, the garbage cans going to the curb or something like that. So I guess he was out in his backyard or something, but, uh, you know, trying to pull a fast one over on their viewers. And uh, that's not what we're here to do. We're going to keep it real. And that's what we've uh, done in the past. We're going to con continue to do that. And uh, maybe it may not make for as uh, exciting episodes, but... Uh, it's cabin life and it's our cabin life. So that's what we're going to share with you. And we really appreciate you uh, subscribing and, and uh, commenting, liking, sharing. And uh, we've got lots of stuff to, uh, to share with you as, as uh, the seasons move on. We'll be finishing the inside of the cabin, putting the, the flooring on. We'll keep you posted. That, that should be coming up in, a, in an update pretty soon within the next few episodes, I hope that we'll get started on that and uh, we'll be doing the walls and then in the spring we'll probably move to the outside to the outside walls with putting that uh, those outside logs uh, on and uh, and we'll also be talking about how to acquire your dream property the steps that you need to go through right Maureen and Maureen spent a, a career in learning about property assessment and enforcing and applying property assessment in the field and very knowledgeable she uh she saw the changes go from uh handwritten notes and documented uh, notes right through the computer age and uh uh the way the way it works now and in uh you know trying to investigate your own property and find out about your own assessment is a whole different story now but maureen was totally abreast of all of that and now in her retirement years we've actually applied that knowledge which was invaluable in saving us a lot of time and energy in finding this very property. So um, I'm sure that there's going to be some tips that you can share with that. Uh, mm -hmm. Planning on doing a few part series on finding your dream property, finding land in Canada, and a lot of it will probably apply to the States and elsewhere as well. So stay tuned for that. Looking forward to that. Good. So hopefully that answers some of your questions, and uh, it probably hasn't answered all your questions. So why not ask them? <laughs> we don't mind. Go ahead and, and uh, ask them down below here, and, and we'll, uh, we'll certainly do our best to, uh, to get to them. We, by the way, we have noticed that our notifications have not given us all of the comments 
uh, for some reason, uh, we didn't get notified that some of the comments were awaiting us uh, in some of the posts on uh, on a couple of our videos. So it's not because we ignored you, it's because for some reason YouTube did not provide us with the notification. Don't know why that happened. So we do appreciate your comments. We read each and every one. Thanks. Maybe we'll have another part coming up soon on some more Q&As right here on Cabin Life. Thank you.